serious. Uh, you can laugh if you want. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. <laughs> We've been having laughing meditation before joining the session. <laughs> Great. So most of you are here and it's the last morning. But there we go. We're going to have a little Dhamma talk as usual and some meditation with Ajahn Brahm. So nothing much will be different this morning. And then in the afternoon session, we'll do things slightly differently. We'll have a little closing talk and a guided meta meditation. And then we'll tell you a bit more about our project and um, what it is about and maybe how you would like to be involved and um, why it's important to us anyway. And uh, after that, of course, we'll be having another session which is completely offline and private session just for us to talk together. So that will happen from two till three today in the UK time zone. So handing over to Ajahn Brown for a little Dhamma talk and a nice meditation to start the day. Thank you, Ajahn. Excellent. It is my pleasure to do that. And because we're just having a bit of laughter beforehand, you know that when I first became a monk, I didn't think that monks were allowed to laugh. A really weird idea. I thought that when a person left the world, all the emotions disappeared. But of course, I think I mentioned already, it's not all the emotions disappear, all the negative emotions disappear. And you have the positive ones left. Because the positive emotions, such as you know, laughter, seeing things in the world, and instead of taking them so seriously, which is our tendency, we can actually look a, a bit on the lighter side of life. And when we do that, we can only really do that uh, when we sometimes change our perceptions. Again, the way we look at the world, the way that we relate to the world. I often say that, you know, sometimes that we can just search for the negative and just bring up the negative and get depressed by the negative. Well, right beside that, there's always this wonderful, beautiful things happening at the same time. And after a while, we we learn to be able to look at the brighter side of life, the nice side of life. And these great monks would even do that. He had some great laughter uh, with uh, a monk like Ajahn Chah and with all these other monks. One of the stories which comes up in my mind, there was one of the most strict monks in the time of um, well, my time. And he was called Ajahn Mahabur. And he's very, very tough and very, very strict. And in that monastery, if you slept in in the morning, you didn't get up at three o'clock, so you missed the morning meeting, then you couldn't eat that day. You had to fast. And the rule kept very strictly. But one morning, one of the monks slept in. He realized it was too late to get to the hall for the morning chanting session. So what should he do? Being a, a villager, before, you know, the local boy, that he went into the forest and he searched and searched and caught a chicken, a forest chicken. They're just native to the area. So he caught this poor little chicken and he got a rope and tied the rope around the poor little chicken's neck and he dragged it to the meditation hall. So you can imagine in the middle of the morning, uh, so early morning before dawn, this monk dragging this squawking chicken you know, to the hall and then uh, after dragging the kitchen to the hall, he let it go and sat down. And afterwards, so the head monk, this Ajahn Mahabur, said, what have you been doing? You're late, you can't go on arms round this morning, you can't eat, you slept in. And this monk replied, what do you mean I slept in? I didn't sleep in, I came before the chicken. And everyone burst out laughing because that's one of those idioms. It means to get up really early, to get up before the chicken. And all the monks, every monk there burst out laughing. And even Ajahn Mahabur couldn't resist that. And he laughed. He said, okay, you can go on arms round today and eat. Monks, nuns, they would have laughter because they were 
light-hearted. They didn't carry the world too heavily on their shoulders. And it just reminds me, what can I, I'll use this pen. I have a little pen here, just an ordinary pen. And sometimes the Ajahn Chah would hold up something and he'd ask me, he said, Aj Ajahn Brahma, Brahma Wangso, he said, is the pen heavy? Is his pen heavy? And then before I could answer, he'd throw it away. He said, it's only heavy when you hold it, when you keep hanging on to it. But if you can just put it down, it's not heavy anymore. Little simple teachings like that meant so much because it meant I could put things down, let them go, and just carry on without having these things as a heavy burden to carry with me into the meditation or into the daily world. You could learn how to put things down and let them go. It was another instructions, another um, a way of looking at life, which I was taught to be able to let things go and not to think you have to hold on to these things. It was the same way that I'm just rambling as usual, thoughts which come up into my mind, the talk is never planned. Just like the time when I was a young, young boy, I started doing really, really, really well at school. And when I did really well at school, I also liked playing soccer. And so I was uh, playing soccer and really enjoying it. And then my teachers and parents said, stop chasing a football. Instead, they said, just stay at home, do your homework, do a bit more study because you're doing well. And if I do well at the O levels, remember the O levels that people had, GCEs? And if you do well at the O levels, and you pass them, then you'll be happy. You know, a lot of time I believe them. I believe that, yeah, I'll follow what my teachers and parents and relations said. And I studied instead of uh, becoming a football star. I could have made a lot of money playing football. You didn't realize just how good a career it was at the time. But anyway, that instead, <laughs> instead of chasing a ball, I chased the exam results and I did really well. But the problem was if once I passed my O levels, that promise that once you pass and do well, then you get happy, didn't eventuate. Because having passed one set of exams, I had to face another set of exams, the A-levels. And at that time, I was a young man. And instead of chasing footballs, I was chasing girls. And instead of actually uh, going out to parties and stuff, my parents and my teachers said, stay home, do your homework. Because if you pass your A-levels, then you'll really be happy. So that's what I did, I believed them. And I did well in my A-levels. And what happens next? University. I said, no, no, don't worry. You go to university, you get a good university, you get a good degree, then you'll be happy for the rest of your life. And so that's why I believed them. Did well in the A-levels, got to Cambridge, started studying, doing really well. But I often tell people that's the time I started getting suspicious. While other people were telling me, I started to challenge. I started to look at people who were much older than I was, who had been to university. Were they really happy? And I looked at them, but most of them weren't. They passed their degrees, but now they had to go to work, work really hard to get a house or to get a car or to get something. And then they got married and that cost me even more money and had to really work even harder. And then they had children and that took up many years of their life. And then later on, you see those who were older, they were thinking, oh, when my children leave home, when they sort of get old enough, then, then we can be happy. Then we can go traveling around places. But then when their children leave home and they've got a bit of money, then they have COVID. So they can't go anywhere, they're stuck. <laughs> and then they think, oh, once COVID is over, then we can be happy. And you start noticing something. When I get this, when this is got rid of, then I can be happy. And I also noticed at the time, you know, being in a country like UK, that most of the people who go to churches are the elderly people. I wonder why is that the case? Because all the people who go to these churches or other religious buildings, they have the idea, yeah, well, if I go to church, then when I die, then I'll be happy. It's always putting off the happiness for another time, thinking if I do this, then I'll get that. And being a sort of a a person who would question, 
I started asking, is this really the way of life? Trying to struggle, to strive to do this and get the instructions from some expert, there's plenty of experts out there, on if I meditate properly, if I change my posture, if I change my meditation object, put more effort or less effort, if I do that and follow all these teachings, then I'll be happy. <laughs> Please don't get sucked into that myth of life. I realized that if I wanted happiness, you'd have to find it right here, right now. It was a relationship which I would have with whatever I was doing, wherever I was. And some of the, uh, the greatest of teachings which I got were very simple ones. Things like, this was a, told to me, I've written this in the book because more people need to hear this sort of stuff. I went, uh, I was uh, visited, or a man visited me from Sydney, and he told me a story about Ajahn Chah, which I'd never heard before. And that was when that he, Ajahn Chah was becoming famous, and he was still able to speak, he hadn't had his stroke yet. And this Sydney man went all the way from Australia to Ajahn Chah's monastery in the northeast of Thailand, the only reason to actually to ask some questions was a great master. And eventually, it was a long distance and a, very difficult to get to because Nachan Chao was out in the, the sort of whoop whoops of Thailand in the more remote areas. But when this businessman eventually got there and he found where Ajahn Chah was in this monastery, he saw Ajahn Chah surrounded by so many other people. And those people were asking all sorts of questions or just having chit chats, having jokes. And but this poor man he was waiting and waiting for one or two hours until he realized that he was getting no closer to uh, being able to ask his questions from this great teacher, even though he'd come all the way from Australia just for that one purpose. And so he just gave up. And he got up and started walking away. And as he was walking away, he realized the taxi, which was going to take him back to the airport so he can catch a, an aircraft back to local aircraft, back to Bangkok, and then from Bangkok uh, to Australia. The, the taxi was not going to come for another hour. So he decided just to, you know, to almost like killing time, to pick up a broom and help some of the other monks sweep around the dining area. And as he was sweeping, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned around in great surprise. It was the teacher, Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah had seen this man sitting in the back of this large gathering, got up and decided to give this man something for all the effort of coming all that way from Thailand to meet him. And all that Ajahn Chah could say through the interpreter was, if you're going to sweep, give it everything you've got. And then Ajahn Chah went away. That's a one sentence. And the Sydney man told me he remembered that sentence because it came from a person who was incredibly busy, but very wise, and it was something valuable to him. So in the aircraft home, he told me, he kept thinking about that saying, if you're going to sweep, give it everything you've got which meant that when he was at work, he'd give work everything he had, and he would not think about his family. And when he got home, he would not think about his work, he'd give family everything he had when he was at home. When he was uh, resting, relaxing, playing, as a lay person does, he was giving that play everything he had. And when he was meditating, he just let go of the family, let go of the work, let go of the play, and gave his meditation everything he had. Whatever he was doing, he gave it 100% full attention. And he said as a result of that, his meditation just really took off. So did his business prosper, and his family life was just so rewarding for him. It was the case that many people, whatever we're doing, we were meditating, we're thinking about work. When we're working, we're thinking about going home. When we're home, we're thinking about going on a retreat. We're never really here, never putting enough 
attention, enough mindfulness in this wonderful present moment where life actually occurs. And little teachings like that, when I heard them, they meant so much to everything which I was doing in life. Yes, I am a meditator. Yeah, I am a teacher. Yeah, I am a worker. I'm an author. I do many things. But I always remember that whatever you do, you learn how to give it everything you have. And when you do that, the results are just sometimes stunning. They surprise me. I think many of you have read some of my books, and especially the first book which I ever wrote. I only wrote it because almost forced to. The taught the teachings had helped some people. They wanted to write a book themselves about what I taught, and they made such a bad job of it. I decided I'd have to do it myself, but didn't have much inclination to write. So when I was on a two-week retreat, I decided one hour every afternoon, just one hour, and I was strict with myself. I wouldn't go over one hour. I just write out some of these stories by hand. Didn't have a computer at the time. And I wrote those stories out by hand, one hour every afternoon. And after, what was it, 14 afternoons, I found I had about 54 stories. And because it was during the middle of a meditation retreat I was doing, it was a little bit of exercise in the afternoon. But I wrote those stories out and the sentences, the paragraphs were perfect. I never needed any changes. I still have the original manuscript. And when I look at that manuscript, wow, did I do that? Because you were so peaceful so focused, so relaxed, because it's during the middle of our meditation retreat, that everything just flowed perfectly. I had half the book done in just 15 hours of one hour every afternoon. And I wasn't into trying to achieve anything, so I let it alone for a month or so, then did the next half equally quickly. It's such a simple book to write, so quick, not on a computer, and did it, hardly needed any when I say hardly needed, didn't need any sort of corrections. And then, <laughs> I must finish the story because it's a good story. Then when I went off to uh, try and get a publisher for the book, how do you get your books published? I didn't know, I'd never done that before. I got, did get someone to type it up for me. And they put it on one of these little discs. And they just finished it just before I was going to go to Melbourne to give some talks. So just at the last minute, they gave me this little CD, disc, whatever it's called, and I put it in my bag and kind of forgot about it. And then the first talk I gave after I landed in Melbourne, I uh, was at Melbourne University. And after the talk, this woman came up. I'll never forget this uh, episode. She came up to me and said, oh, that was a wonderful talk. And she said, I work in the publishing industry. If ever you have any books which you were interested in, a publishing, please let me have a look at them. And I literally just put my hand in my back <laughs> and took out the disc and said, here you are. <laughs> and she was shocked. You know, it, was, it just happened without you know, going around to publishers or, or you know, trying to argue your case for it to be published. It was just there. And you know, she was a bit stunned and it you know, became a bestseller. But what really surprised me is how simple it all was. When you really focused in the moment, didn't ask for anything, you just gave, putting everything into this moment with some fun, with some care. Of course, sometimes that you don't get things published and there are problems which come up in life, but if just problems come up in life, oh, you have to know the difference. This is a story which comes up. The difference between an irritation and a problem. For most people, you know, they get upset at small things. When you know the difference between an irritation and a problem, then much of the things which we worry about in life, you can just let go of so easily, just like that pen. We can put it down, uh, forget about it, because it's not that important. And that was the story of a backpacker many years ago, actually quite a lot of years ago, because this American gentleman, was young man, was backpacking through Europe, visiting all the great cities, getting small jobs, mostly in restaurants as a waiter or as a cleaner. 
and uh, saving money and then going on to the next destination, thereby visiting some of the most beautiful parts of Europe. And during his journey, he was working in a, a small restaurant in Vienna. There's no cleaning up, serving the tables, whatever was, was available. And the owner of the restaurant, you know, would give, always give them free food and they get tips and they would get a little, uh, some money as well. It's a nice way as a backpacker could pay their way through their travels. But this restaurant, the owner of the restaurant by some mistake had ordered too much sauerkraut, you know, which is, you know, some people, even here in Bodhinyana Monastery, some monks will love sauerkraut. As for me, it really stinks. But that's because grown up in a different culture. But anyway, they had all this sauerkraut, which he'd over ordered. So the owner of the restaurant told everybody, if you want to eat anything for the next couple of weeks for free, it has to be sauerkraut. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, he said, you didn't care. If you want free food, sauerkraut. Anything else you have to pay for. And the American got really upset. He said, this is not in the contract. This is not how it's supposed to work. You know, you've deceived us, you've cheated us. And the American got very, very angry. At which point the, the cook came out, this old cook came out. And the cook so sort of took him aside and said to the American, I want to teach you the difference between a problem and an irritation. And the old cook just bared his arm and you could see some numbers tattooed on his arm. And he said, I was in Auschwitz, it's a true story. He said, I survived somehow. Every morning when I woke up, I literally didn't know whether I'd be able to go to bed that night or whether I'd be dead. He said, living in Auschwitz is a problem. Having sauerkraut for breakfast, lunch and dinner is only an irritation. The American understood that story and how so often we get upset and angry over little things, which when we see the important things in life, the problems in life, and can make a difference between problems and irritations. The irritations are things so we can just let go of. You don't need to overreact to them. So all of those difficulties we have in life, it's a waste of time getting irritated and getting angry. Even just recently, some of the things which you have to do as a monk is not just meditating or writing books. Sometimes people think you're wise, so they come and ask for guidance on all sorts of parts of their life, like the old marriage counselling. And quite often that men and women will come together in front of me and they say, oh, I don't know why I married this man. He's lazy, he's hopeless, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you say, well, I know why you married him. You know, because he's been telling me about all your faults as well. He said, you're imperfect. That's why I said, you know, you, you're imperfect. Your husband's imperfect. That's why you're a good match. <laughs> In other words, we always think somebody else is imperfect. Or we always look at our own imperfections. But if you look at both people's imperfections and you realize this is the nature of being a human being, that you're not perfect, you make mistakes. When you realize you make mistakes, you can do what other people do when they make mistakes. You can share your mistakes and laugh at them, realizing that this is the nature of human beings. We're an imperfect, we're learning, we're growing. And the whole idea of trying to be perfect and why what other people think of you. Oh, I just get so much criticism in my life as a monk. And I also get so much praise in my life as a monk. We're just talking before, and which one should I accept? The praise or the blame? <laughs> and I say neither. <laughs> They're both madness. <laughs> How can they praise you? It's just your good karma to you know, have those teachers, have those experiences, and be able to sort of grow like this. Everyone would eventually get to the same place of wisdom. It takes a bit of a while trying to sort of fast track you all to get some nice deep meditations and become wise. But why do we worry what other people think of us? Why do we worry what we think of ourselves? 
what's that old saying? That when you're in your 20s, maybe this doesn't occur in our modern world, but it certainly occurred when I was a young man, when you're in your 20s, no, teenagers, early 20s, before you became a monk, you were really concerned what other people thought of you. You know, I had to be fashionable. And I, that's why I, the fashion in those days, crazy fashion, was a big fuzzy hair. And where my hair finished, it was all big fuzzy hair down to here. That's where my beard started. It was like a donut look. It was really useful in the cold weather in UK. It was just like having a hat all the way around. And my face was in the middle, you could just see it. So it's very, very, very helpful to keep yourself warm. But that was kind of fashionable amongst, you know, my group of uh, people. I even had, believe it or not, green velvet trousers, which I went to things like the Iron and White Festival, rock festivals, uh, rock festivals and stuff. But anyway, that you always had to have the right type of, of speech. And you, know, you kind of learn that because you're trying to impress other people. But then I became a monk, so I wasn't impressing anybody. But when he did become a monk, I realized that other people, when you get to be your 30s or 40s, then you don't really care what other people think of you. You've got sometimes self-confidence. That's why you see people just relaxing. And then, So when you're in your 40s and 50s, you don't really care what other people think of you. And then when you're in your... 60s or 70s or 80s, like many of you have got elderly parents, you'll find that the elderly finally discover that people weren't thinking about you anyway. They were thinking about themselves. So you don't really have to worry at all what other people think of you. They're not thinking about you. Yay! So you can be free. But more than that, people keep thinking about themselves. They project what other people think of them onto others. So often, even today, you know, someone came to monastery and just talking to them after lunch. It's you know, five o'clock in the afternoon here. And they were saying that no one loves them, no one cares for them. He said, what are you talking about? You know, you know your family, they really care and love you. And no, they don't. And I said, why not? It's because I'm a terrible person. I looked at them, you're not a terrible person. He said, yes, I am. So what we did, because we live in a democracy, I said, okay, all the monks here and all the visitors here, what do you think about this gentleman? Is he a terrible person or a good person? So we had a democratic vote. And we all agreed unanimously he was a good person. That made him laugh. And maybe just started to crack the idea of his self, um, self, what do you even call it, self-loathing. And just so critical about himself. Nothing he did work, nothing, nothing he was, he was happening to him was working. And so after a while, you start to challenge what other people think of you and also what you think of you. And you said, basically, you don't know. It's wonderful to be free of that, free of this terrible thing called praise and blame. But it's not just free of praise and blame. But sometimes that you can understand why people have low self-esteem, why they don't think very much of themselves and why they think they can't meditate. While well, they think that, oh my goodness, Ajahn Brahm, he, te he teaches too highly. Jhanas, enlightenment, oh, not for me. Other people maybe, but not for me. I just want to just be able to go to sleep at night and uh, be able to have some peace in my life. But you know, sometimes when we, we look more deeply and practice more deeply, we find there's nothing we can't do. Because when it comes to the the accepting praise this well this um this example really made a great difference in my life because you know, i've been working very hard for so many organizations not just my own organization or an accompany bikini project but all sorts of causes and because of that that i got a letter one day from one of our local universities saying would you mind accepting this prize called a john curtin medal for all of your good works. And I thought, ah, no, why? But all the friends said, no, you must accept this. It's a very prestigious. So I went along there to the, the ceremony and they gave me this lovely little medal, but I had to give a speech of acceptance. My speech of acceptance was that 
Thank you very much. It's a great honor. But quite frankly, there's other people in the community who do much more work than I do, who deserve it much more than I do. And anyway, I couldn't have been able to achieve this without the help of all my friends, but thank you anyway. And then I accepted it and just went away. And the next year I went to somebody else's investiture of this medal. And they were just a really impressive person. It was actually a doctor who was um, noticed that after the best chemotherapy, radiation therapy or surgery you can get in the world, that the patients were leaving hospitals with actually you no know, real aftercare. And so he managed to find some rooms in the local hospital and turn it into an alternative medicine center where anyone could get Reiki, foot massage, homeopathy, acupuncture, anything which, you know, in his words, were not really totally accepted by the scientific community. He would give it to people for free. And he did this risk, risking his reputation in the hospital. And the results were just so amazing that people after these terrible procedures, you know, for this terrible disease, they had somebody looking after them for half an hour, just whether Reiki or homeopathy or foot massage or whatever, despite whether you think whether it works or not, you have somebody caring for you for half an hour for free, talking to you, massaging you. And I know from my own understanding of the human body and its interaction with the mind, that such kindness has a huge effect. And he risked his reputation to do that. And the results were just so amazing. So when he got his prize, his John Curtin medal, you know, his, his speech, in his, his speech, I was listening to it. He said, well, thank you very much for this award. I don't think I deserve it. There are other people in the community who do much better work than I do. And I couldn't have done this anyway without the help of all my friends. And it really struck me that was almost exactly the same speech I gave the year before. And I thought, that man deserved that award. He was a hero. And then I started to think the unthinkable, that maybe I deserve my award. Maybe the praise was deserved. I thought, why is it when we get praise, we reject it? Why is it so hard when somebody says, Venerable Chanda, you're an amazing bhikkhuni, a great nun. And you think, no, 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 not me. He's just saying that for some other reason. Why is it we always tend to push away praise? But when it's criticism, when you say, oh, you should have done this better. You should have made this longer. You should have done this. When it's criticism, oh, yeah, and you feel very terrible. We accept criticism. We soak it in. But praise, we reject it. Whereas if you want to be a happier, stronger human being, we should find a better balance and accept some more praise and some of the criticism to let that go. So what the praise does, I found this, that if somebody praises you, you want to do the same wonderful sacrifice, the wonderful gift, the wonderful service again. The more you get praised, the more you want to do it. And you improve, you get better at doing it. <coughs> so that's why when people come on a retreat and they meditate, well done, everybody. But I've been sleeping most of the time. Well, you haven't been breaking your precepts when you've been sleeping. You always see the positive side of things. But, 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 but I've just been just not helping anybody. It's wonderful. You have been helping somebody. They're probably so very happy that you haven't been a pain in the butt for the last few days because you've been on retreat. <laughs> or whatever it is, find some sort of excuse to praise yourself. Because when you praise yourself, you get encouraged. When you get encouraged, you get more energy. When you get more energy, you just you get more, more depth in the meditation practice. And you find when you start praising yourself, or at least get at peace with yourself, then you find you have more opportunity to be in this wonderful present moment. Whatever you have to do. And then you give it everything you've got, 100%. So even all the talks which I give, all the meditation instructions which I give, all the books which I write, all the, the stuff which I have to do. I always remember that teaching of Ajahn Chah. I give it 100%. Give it everything you've got. You know, I've, actually, I've used that story uh, quite a few times. 
especially when we have fundraising. Before people leave the hall, I say, remember that story of Ajahn Chah. Whatever you do, give it everything you've got. So I said, there's a donation box. Please remember to give it everything you've got. <laughs> and I can't help sort of laughing at myself when I say such things, because I'm not into that sort of uh, extortion of my disciples and friends. They give enough already. But anyway, just the idea of whatever you're doing, give 100% and see what happens. And some of the stuff which I think, oh, that was not a good talk. And somebody comes along after and said, that was the best talk I ever heard in my life. I said, really? So I thought it was terrible, but they thought it was good. You now you can't really judge. It's one of the reasons why you just give, expecting nothing back in return. You're just giving to the meditation. And sometimes uh, people ask, well, Ajahn Brahm, you know, there's so many opportunities for giving, which is part of our path. What do you give? I've got no money. But on this occasion, this story, I, one of the first times I visited Singapore, and I was being taken around to all the different temples in Singapore. I went to the, the Sri Lankan temple, so there were the big Sri Lankan temple in Singapore. And when I went there, they took me around. They're very kind, very hospitable. But at the end, they said, can you please sign the visitor's book? So I was very happy to do that. But you know, sometimes you make a mistake. <laughs> I make many mistakes. When I make mistakes, there's always something wonderful happens as a result of my mistakes I make in life. I picked up the book without really looking at it. I opened the page. And I wrote down my name, had a, a column there for your name and address, Ajahn Brahm, Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. And the next column was how much I was going to donate. Oh my goodness, I picked up the wrong book. I picked up the donation book, not the visitor's book. <laughs> and it was a book where you had to write down how much you were donating to the temple. And I was a monk, I don't have any money. I don't carry any cash. I don't have a credit card. I don't have a bank account. What should I do? But I love it when you put in a spot of sort of embarrassment, but of opportunity as well. So the only thing which I could think of to give was these two words, my life. <laughs> That's what I donated, donated. I donate my life to Buddhism, Singapore and the Sri Lankan temple, any temple. And afterwards, it always gives me a lot of happiness. I donate a really good good gift. Don donate my life. And even when I'm meditating, I'm just giving my time to this moment. It's like I see this moment as a being. So here's my life, here's my attention, here's me, take it. So I don't try and get anything out of this. For me, meditation is a giving, it's a donation. For me, just teaching. Don't get anything out of this except headaches or something. <laughs> because all the other stuff I'm supposed to be doing, which I'm not. So whatever you're doing, you, you give, expecting nothing back in return. You just give. You don't want anything. And that donation gives you a great sense of peace and stillness. So those people who think you can't meditate, you think you've been trying this meditation for a long time, it doesn't work. It is because you're trying to get something. You hear all the the landmarks and you think I want to get to this landmark and that landmark and another landmark. It doesn't work that way. But if you're just happy to be here, so content to be in this moment, you might be tired. Wonderful. Just be tired. You may be restless. Wonderful. Be restless. But at least get rid of the wanting and the ill will. Want to be here and give everything to this moment. Your whole being your whole mind, just to being here and see what happens. Yeah, it might be a little bit uncomfortable at first and painful at first. When you give totally to this moment, give everything you've got in this moment, find that after a very short while, just whatever aches and pains, tiredness, discomfort, negativity tends to vanish. It just goes slowly, it just evaporates. And as you give everything, because you don't want anything, you're not trying to get rid of things, 
giving everything to this moment means you really get into this present moment. You're not giving everything to this moment to get somewhere or to get rid of things. There's nothing wanted in return. And as you give not wanting nothing back in return, you find you get very peaceful. You get very joyful. The mind brightens up. All those teachings I was giving earlier about the the energy of the mind increasing, the joy increasing. Naturally, you're not, not what you're doing, this is just what happens, whether you want it or not. And you get more alert, more joyful, more happy. You find you can laugh more easily. <laughs> Why not? And you, you find you can have more energy, you can be in this moment. And it also means that the mind brightens and the meditation gets so powerful. So it is true, one of the best types of meditation is being still, doing nothing and giving everything you have to the task of doing nothing. Don't do, don't do nothing with half a heart. Do it with your full heart, just being here, relaxing, being still and finding what's really here when you're not busy looking for something else. There you find enormous teachings, enormous sort of profundity and depth in the path of meditation. Sometimes that we have more than enough peace. We're looking for it somewhere else. An old Zen saying, just the farmer the farmer wanted to cook his rice. He had the rice in the pot, the water, had the wood in the fire underneath. But he needed something to light the fire. So he could not find his box of matches anywhere. He was looking all over his house with the candle for the box of matches. If only he knew what fire was, he could have cooked his dinner much earlier. So that's a little talk <laughs> for this morning for you. There we go. I don't know if that was any good, but anyway, praise and blame. Who knows? Sad, sad, sad. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, so we'll have a five minute break now? Yes, yeah, and then we do uh, some. Then we, then we have 40 minutes of doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great time. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mute myself.
Yay, Abab muted. Excellent. So I think, shall we start the meditation? Excellent, good. So you're sitting down. Closing your eyes. And bring everything you've got to the present moment. Let's come here. See what's going on right now. Be part of the action of now. You notice a lot of time we're always going somewhere to get something. Or we're just lingering on the past, I don't know really why. Just obsessed with a lot of times our failures. It's not really our failures, it's just we're learning. And now, just to start the meditation, I invite you actually to Remember some of the past, but not just any part of the past. See if you can remember the happiest moment of your life so far, or one of them. A time when everything was beautiful and calm, peaceful. Where were you? On the, one of the happiest times of your life so far. Who was with you? What time of the day? What was the weather like? You build up the picture of one of the happiest moments so far in your life. Why was it happy? If you're perceptive, you'll find it was because of this thing we call contentment. It may not be in a perfect time. It may have not have been so comfortable or so the right temperature or the right time. You will have had times in your life when it's like if you're back there right now, you wouldn't want anything else in the world to change. You wouldn't want different people to be around you. The people who were around you were more than good enough. You yourself at that moment were good enough. The time was good enough to be content. And to allow that contentment of not wanting anything in the whole world to be different in that moment. not needing anything more. And if you found a, uh, an old bottle with a genie inside and the genie gave you three wishes, you say, no, thank you. I don't want anything more in the whole world than just this. You'll find that those moments of deep contentment, which each one of you have had in your life, were all signified by this wonderful sense of peace, of realizing life didn't need to be perfect. It was more than good enough. You didn't need anything more. The moment itself was satisfying. You weren't struggling to keep anything. You're just being here. And all the wanting and all the trying to cure things and get rid of things, improve things. When you didn't want anything else, you could enjoy what was already happening.
one of those old sayings. When you want something more, even in meditation, especially in meditation, when you want something more, you can't enjoy what you're already experiencing. After a while we learn how to experience what's here. You don't want anything in the whole world. We give 100% attention to contentment. You find things don't need to be perfect to have contentment. Even you may feel a bit uncomfortable, or for me in this hot afternoon in Australia, you may feel a bit hot. It's good enough. Over the years, you've learned to find contentment with things which would irritate you in the past. The contentment gives you peace. Stillness. Enjoy. Sometimes I remember as a, a kid or going to poor parts of Thailand as a young monk, seeing how children can be so content with so simple things and so much joy and happiness with hardly anything. I remember those times teaching me just how to be content without needing limiters or jhanas. To be content right now. Feel that contentment. This is safe enough. It's good enough. I deserve a break. I deserve not to have to do anything in the whole world. Not to achieve anything or cure anything in this moment. Or that business I can do later on. Right now, nothing is being here. Being in this moment, content with it. After a while you find just how you can be content with what other people feel is just so difficult to, to endure. That word endure and enjoy are so close together. So instead of enduring, I learn to enjoy this moment. Hot. Until my mind relaxes. I find my body relaxes as well. Remember the most beautiful time of my life so far. Sitting here like you're in the heaven. Like you don't want anything in the whole world. You don't need anything more. And then you just check your body, which I always have to do. Because I've been just blitting out, just being content. Sometimes you do realize my legs are in a stupid position. So pull on legs, okay, I will move you. Check your legs. Check your butt. Check the body all over, as I've taught you how to do it, and all channels taught you how to how to do it so many times. Feel your body, you get to know your body. It's a good old friend. 69 years we've been together my body and I. First few years, I'll just try to control you. But the last years, I really got to know you well. Just like a, a devoted couple, husband and wife, who've been together for such a long time. They know each other very well, and they care for one another. And they're peaceful with one another. That's my body and I. 
I look after my body. My body looks after me. Just relaxing together. Enjoy, enjoying this moment, not enduring it, but enjoying it. This moment will never come again. It's totally unique. And I relax with it. If there's any sort of burden that's like that pen, I just put it down, let it go for a while. If it's important, it will come back to me afterwards. Right now, no stress to hold on to things. Just let everything be. And I still remember that feeling of contentment. Started off just as a memory from the past. The emotion of contentment, which I bring from the past and put in this present moment, helps with this meditation. I'm just happy to be here. I'm not asking for anything in my meditation. I'm giving. This is my gift of peace to my body and mind. Bring all my attention in this moment and caring in peace. Feeling my body get so comfortable if I need to move it, I will. Body, I, I care for you, I love you. You're important to me, body. So I'll try and make you comfortable and happy. Even just those words. Make my body just feel that it's not abused. It knows it's cared for. So it relaxes so deeply. It doesn't need to tense up through fear. It eases off through kindness. And I'm looking at my bodies. No place which is tight or stretched or squashed. Find a little bit of tightness around my eyes. And I just loosen off those muscles. The awareness of letting go. The new awareness of the new relaxation. Feedback allows me to relax. Relax to the max. When I feel I'm relaxed, I can always take it a little bit more deeper. It's also so joyful and fun to watch this body relax. So the body by itself just vanishes, goes inside, inside the body, like the body is a shell. You're inside that shell, in this bubble of the mind. You can feel the, the body, but it's almost like becoming more distant from you. And I'm very careful not to want anything. Not to think, oh, what's the next stage? Where should I get to next? Just being here with whatever comes. Giving now 100% of my attention. So there's nothing left to watch the future or the past. Giving 100% to now inside my body. I often notice that when you really get into the present moment, really get into it, right into the center of now, you haven't got time 
to say anything. I think you're peaceful. I'm feeling that peace now and it's so content, so fulfilling, so joyful. I know what images are and jhanas are and stuff, but contentment is all I ever want. It's here. So all my wanting, all my wanting starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller when I focus on contentment. Happy to be here. Enjoying this moment. As I enjoy this moment, silence. So enjoyable, you can't go into sloth and torpor. The joy keeps you alive, awake, alert. You don't want to miss a thing. It's a boring meditation, like a boring talk. Of course you can fall asleep. The joy. The delight. Right here. Keep sure that. Go right into this moment. You can't resist it. It pulls you in. You go deeper into this moment. So all this breath, delightful breath, limitless, that's where they start from. But please remember it's a meditation develops. Just enjoy. And don't try and develop something like limiters or jhanas. They come by themselves, like fruits on a tree. When the right time comes, you can't control them. You can't make them happen earlier. You can only disturb the process. So right now, in this moment, give, expecting nothing back in return. I'm now going to be quiet until five minutes before the end of the meditation.
Oh, it is getting close to the end of this meditation period. How did the rising of contentment help keep the mind peaceful? Keep it in this moment to empower what meditation is all about. See how peaceful the mind is. And it can notice contentment. Notice there's nothing in the world you need right now. So this wanting turns off. You're just here. Coming more and more. That peace and tranquility has a flavor of delight, joy. Once you notice the joy, tranquility, contentment, it's positively enticing, addictive even. I want to go deeper into the meditation, naturally. And all that work of the mind, struggling and striving, which you know too well, disappears. You're just here, being, disappearing. Finding peace. Please forgive me. It's now time to come out. So start to become aware of your body this shell in which you've been meditating. I'm starting to become aware of my feet now, my legs, my butt, my body and my arms, my shoulders, neck and head. It's like turning on the switch and becoming aware of this thing again. It feels pretty relaxed but not as nice as when it disappears. And when you're ready, just open your eyes. And take your time from opening your eyes to emerge from the meditation. Ooh. Oh, thank you for giving me that opportunity to meditate with you. I enjoyed that. Hopefully you did too. So we have another session in a couple of hours time. And now, fortunately, I've just reminded myself, I've got to go and see some family whose uh, husband, father died. So please excuse me. So I'll see you later on this evening. Bye.